coming up next on Hope Alive. Abraham now begins declaring. He said, I declare this place Jehovah Jireh. I declare this place a place where God will see to it. Whatever your need is, God will see to it. Whatever your battle is, whatever victory you need, God will see to it. Whatever your financial need is, God will see to it. Whatever you need in your life, God will provide and God will see to it. Welcome to Hope Alive, an outreach of Greater Hope International Church, Lumberton, North Carolina. Now join us for today's message with Pastor Ron Barnes. I want to share with you today on the thought of an open heaven, on the thought of an open heaven. In January 2019, our, our praise team, I believe it was on the first Sunday of the year. It may have been the second, but I'm pretty sure it was the first Sunday of that year. They opened up by singing a song, We're Under an Open Heaven, or Open Heaven might be the title. And they sang the song, Open Heaven. And I have heard it said many times that there are places on the earth that are open heavens. It is said that up in the mountains of North Carolina, uh, western North Carolina and eastern Tennessee, there are many that believe that there's a place up there where there is an open heaven where you can seemingly be in touch with God in a greater way. I don't know if that be true or not, but I do know what the Word of God speaks about open heavens and a place that we could call open heaven. The Bible does not use the verbiage open heaven, but I want to share with you today about standing in a place where there is an open heaven. I want you to go with me, if you will, to the book of Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 and 2 then we'll be reading verses 13 and 14 and we're going to be in the King James Version and it's Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 and 2 and then verses 13 and 14 I am reading today from the King James uh, text and I want you to hear what the Word of God has to say this is a, a passage of scripture that all of you will be very familiar with and this is what the word of God has to say to us. And it came to pass after these times that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Then the Bible says for us in verses 13 and 14. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And I want you to listen to the verbiage and how this next sentence is worded. And Abraham called the name of the place. Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. And that is said this day in the mount of the Lord shall it be seen. I want you to underline that phrase. And he called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. He did not say God is Jehovah Jireh. He said the name of this place is Jehovah Jireh. And I have two other places we're going to be going to to tie this together. But first of all, what I want to talk to you about this morning, and I'm going to be as brief as I possibly can, about what are the characteristics of an open heaven. What takes place when you're in a place of an open heaven? There are multiple things that take place, and I'm sure I'm not going to cover them all, but I want to cover these and share these with you so that they might, you might find something, uh, what, something deeper for your own personal life. I want to tie these together so that you can understand that we live in a constant place of an open heaven. First of all, let us look and see what he says to Abraham. We all know the story. Abraham had prayed for a son. He had prayed for his only son. He had prayed for a child. And there with his wife, Sarah, God had given him a son by a concubine. A son's name was Ishmael. But Ishmael was not the son of promise. 
Even though there is a Hagaric covenant that covers Ishmael, he was not the son of promise. Finally, God gives him the son of promise. God gives him a child that he can call completely his own between him and Sarah. You see, it's something to receive a blessing, but it's something to receive a blessing that is a promise from God to you. I've been blessed many times in my life by many things. I have had the blessings of the Lord flow on my life in many different ways. But all oh, brothers and sisters, when God spoken to me and said, I give you this promise, and then you see the promise fulfilled, it's a whole nother level of blessing. Can I say this to someone maybe that's watching today, or those who are you under my voice? We have been given promises here on this earth. The Bible tells us the promises of God are in him what? In him, yea. And in him, amen. But there are promises that have been given to us other than the war promises that are in the word of God. Maybe God has promised you children. And it was a blessing when your children finally came. I think often of what God has done in my viewing here. And, and Sister Callahan is not here, but, but Sister Watson is here. And Sister Watson is a, 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 a witness to this. And I'll never forget Sister Watson, what God has done in the life of Sister Callahan's granddaughter. Sister Callahan's granddaughter in 2010 came through a prayer line and said, I'm, I, I, we want a child. My husband and I want a child. We've been praying for a child and we've not been able to conceive a child. And we really want to see a child born. Well, it was about a year later that she conceived and brought forth twins. Then it wasn't too long after that she conceived again and brought forth another child. And it wasn't just a little over a year plus ago she conceived once again and brought forth triplets. And now the lady who had no children, they now have six children. Why are you bringing that up, preacher? You see, that was a promise that they longed for and they were given by God. And when you receive that kind of promise, it is so fulfilling to you. It may not mean anything to anybody else, but it means something special to you. She received the promise of God. And Abraham is now in the same position Abraham is seeking. And he has a promised child. Well, we don't really know the age of Isaac. But most scholars believe that Isaac was in his 20s. He believed he was a young man. He was a young adult. And he'd be old enough to work with his dad. And old enough to be with his dad. And he, God tells Abraham, go to a place. Go to the land of Moriah. And there in the land of Moriah, I want you to do something. I want you to sacrifice your son. Now, I'm not real. Uh, I really think that the proper wording here in the King James is not the proper wording because it says God tempted Abraham. Uh, the Bible tells us in the book of James that God cannot tempt any man. You cannot, God cannot tempt any man. God can prove a man. The same Hebrew word that they used here for, for tempt is the same word that is used for prove or test. God was not tempting Abraham to do anything evil. He was proving Abraham's faith. I believe this very act of faith is why he is called the father of the faith. I believe this very act of faith. The Bible says he, he sojourned and he looked for a land, a city whose builder and maker was God. The Bible says also in the New Testament of Abraham, he staggered not at what? The promises of God. He staggered not at the promises of God. Am I talking to anyone who's had some promises? And right now in the weight of this pandemic, in the weight of everything that's going on, it feels like the promise is being withheld. And it feels like the promise will never come. I've prayed and I've sought the Lord and I've said, Lord, this is what you have promised. This is why I'm here. Lord, this is what you've said. And I've seen you speak so many times and it comes to pass. Why do you delay? And I can confess to you, I've said that, Lord, why do you delay? And I get the same answer back every time that I pray that prayer. 
He delays because he's God and he knows the right season in which to bring it. Sometimes it's easy to get ahead of God. Have you ever gotten ahead of God? Have you ever got out of season? Have you ever expected something when it wasn't time? I'm here to tell you if God would give you everything you prayed for exactly when you prayed for it, it would be maybe too great for you to handle. There are times that God will allow blessings to be delayed in your life. Because he knows that where you are right now spiritually or where you are right now socially or where you are right now intellectually or financially, you won't be able to handle what is getting ready to bring on your life. But he waits till you mature and in the maturation process, <laughs> when you reach that place, he will release the blessing on your life. God knows exactly when to bring the promise to you. He's given the promise to Abraham. Abraham, here's the words, go and take your son's life. We don't have, I'm sure that we do not have a complete, uh, we don't have a complete definition. We don't have a complete point by point uh, outline of the narrative, but we know the narrative. He takes his son, he gathers the kindling, and he gathers the implements that he would need to build an altar and he goes to the land of Moriah. What I normally do and what I did in this case is I looked up what the meaning of the word Moriah is. Or the name Moriah. You know in the Hebrew names have great significance. And I looked up the word Moriah, the name Moriah. And it means the land of teaching. The land of teaching and a place of worship. And it also says a place chosen of God. A land of teaching, a place of worship, and chosen of God. Uh, I, I've, I am now at this late age in my life and this time of studying in my life, I'm finding out more and more the more I study the word of God. God wants to teach us. He wants us to gain knowledge of him. And the only way you draw closer to God is gaining more knowledge of God. And I'm here to tell you that God says to Abraham, I want you to go, but not just go anywhere. I want you to go to a place where I'm going to teach you something. I'm going to send you somewhere where you're going to be able to learn something. I want you to go to a place that I have chosen. And there in the place that I have chosen, I will teach you. And when I teach you there, you will be able to worship me. Did you hear what I said? God's saying, I've chosen a place for you to go. And when you go there, I'm going to teach you something. And when you will receive what I have taught you, then you will be able to worship me. Our problem is we don't want to be taught by God. We want to be preached to. We want to shout and we want to run and we want to hoop and we want to holler. But we don't want to be taught the word of God. God says, I've chosen a place so I can teach you. And if you receive my teaching then you will be able to truly worship me uh, too often we're just jumping in and calling that which we call it worship but it's not worship it's all it all it is emotional stirs I remember as a young boy coming up in the Pentecostal church I could not wait till they started shouting in the church now I was raised in a church where they didn't shout all the time uh, I was raised in a church where we had great pastors and we had great talent and we had great singers and our choir could sing the roof off of the place and we had a music pastor uh, Paul Miller was his name and Paul Miller was had a first tenor's voice and he would make your hair stand up on your head he was bald he couldn't make his own hair stand up but he could make your hair stand up he had an anointing on his life but oh I'm here to tell you we had teaching there but I just would wait for them to start singing something and I'd watch the because you know you could tell who was going to shout I knew exactly who was going to shout and how they were going to shout have you ever been in any of those places brother and sister that's emotionalism and I'm not against shouting and I'm not against running we have had that here at greater hope but brother and sister if you receive the word of God God, then you can truly worship God. He said, I've chosen a place where I'm going to teach you something. And when I teach you this great truth, you will be able to worship me, Abraham, like you've never worshipped me before. Did you hear what I said? Abraham, 
And this is for the last time. I've chosen a place. It's the land of Moriah. I want you to go there. And when you go there, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And when you receive what I'm going to teach you, you'll worship me like you've never worshipped me before. The Bible tells us, and you know the story, he goes and he's ready to take the life of his son. Why was he so willing to take the life of his son? If you go back and read uh, the, the, the first part of that chapter, he tells his young men that work for him, and he tells those that are waiting with, with the, the donkeys and waiting with the, uh, the beast of burden, he says, wait here. My son and I are going to go up there. We're going to worship and sacrifice to the Lord, but we will return. He didn't say, I will return. He said, we will return. Why is he called the father of faith? Because he knew Isaac was a son of promise. And God had already said, from Isaac, I'm going to raise up many nations. And they will be like the sands of the sea. So he knew, if I slay him, God will resurrect him. And I will not come back off the mountain alone. I'm going to come back with my promise behind me. How many of you are willing to say, Lord, I'm going to go to the place of worship. And when I come back, I'm not going to leave my, my, my promise on the mountain. I'm going to bring the promise with me. Some of you are getting ready to receive your promise. Some of you are getting ready to step into your promise. Some of you are getting ready to reap your harvest. Some of you are getting ready to learn something where you can worship God as you've never worshipped God before. God has chosen a place for you if you're willing to learn you will worship like you've never worshipped before. The problem is there are so many that are not willing to learn. There are those who think that they have come to the place where they have arrived. I will be 70 years old in December. And I'm far from arriving. I'm trying to ever learn. I'm trying to ever gain knowledge of the word of God. I'm trying to ever seek wisdom and direction by the Spirit of God. He says, go to the land of Moriah. We, uh, there are those that said, go to Mount Moriah. I've heard them say, they said, well, go to Mount Moriah. He doesn't say, go to Mount Moriah. He says, go to the land of Moriah. Moriah was not one single place. If you study it properly, you'll see that it's multiple hills. And he said, just go to that area because there I'm going to deal with you like I've never dealt with you before. And you know the narrative. He puts him on the altar. He's getting ready to sacrifice him. And then suddenly there's a ram in the bush. And I, you've heard sermons on the ram in the bush. He sees the ram and... I don't know what kind of emotions he went through. I'm sure that he cried. I'm sure he praised God. I'm sure it was a glorious time. And I'm sure Isaac was like, whoo, that was close. But anyway, they put the lamb or the ram on the altar and they sacrificed the altar. And this is what Abraham says. Abraham says to his son, there's nobody else there. Abraham declares something over that area. He declares something over that land. And I want you to hear me now. Abraham is 14 generations before Moses. Moses is 14 generations before David. And David was 14 generations before Christ. That's how far back he's talking. He is talking to this man and he's giving this man 40 and two generations prior something that you will see take place in just a moment. I want you to hear this. He says over the land, this place shall be called Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. In the Hebrew it is Yahweh will provide. And if you study the true etymology of that word in the Hebrew, it really means not only will Yahweh will provide, it says Yahweh will see to it. Now listen to that. Yahweh will see 
to it. See to what? Whatever you declare. Okay. Whatever you declare. God did not declare Moriah a place of blessing. He said it's a place I've chosen for you to go and there I'm going to teach you and when you do what I've taught you you'll be able to praise me. So what does Abraham do? Abraham now begins declaring. He said I declare this place Jehovah Jireh. I declare this place a place where God will see to it. Whatever your need is, God will see to it. Whatever your battle is, whatever victory you need, God will see to it. Whatever your financial need is, God will see to it. Whatever you need in your life, God will provide and God will see to it. See to it what? That it is accomplished. God will see to it. What are you trying to tell me? I'm here to tell you that some of you need to go home today and declare your home Jehovah Jireh. You need to declare over your home, declare over your family, declare over the ministry, declare over your own personal life. I am a place of Jehovah Jireh. I am the place where God will see to it. I am the place where God will provide go with me this you see in this place of open heaven there will be mercy and there will be provision it will be provision divine provision that's why David could write I was young and now I'm old never seen the seed forsaken or the children begging bread look and tell someone God will provide uh, I think about our people I said like Danny Wickens, I said to Danny today, I said, Danny, I can't get out of my mind where I saw you the first time. And Danny was working for a temporary agency, making minimum wage. Danny had just got released from a drug rehab, rehab program. Danny had come out of gangs. And on his second time in the initial building, Danny gave his life to Christ. Now Danny is in a supervisory position with one of the large companies in America. And Danny has, he has benefits and he's got a beautiful family. And I looked at him this morning, just this morning in my office. And I was thinking, oh, brother Danny, if you only knew what's ahead of you. You're a place where Jehovah Jireh is. You're the place where God will provide. And not only Brother Danny, but I could go through this church naming person after person after person what God is doing. And then the place of provision. How many of you know that God wants to provide for you? I told the brother that I visited yesterday. I said God will provide, but God expects you to do some work to be blessed. Not only in the open heaven will there be provision, there will be mercy. I want you to go with me, if you will, to 2 Samuel chapter 24, verses 15 through 17. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verses 15 through 17. I'm trying to move quickly through this. I have this point and one other to make, and we'll bring this to a close. But I want you to see what is said here in this place. <coughs> this is a narrative of Daniel, I mean of David. David has taken a census of the people. David has done something that God said, I don't want you to do. Why would David do something that God did not want him to do? <laughs> David had a little bit of ego now. He's in the midst of people that are enemies of his. And in the midst of this place, David wants to know that he is able to fight the war he wants to be able to declare that my army is this large and this is what I have and this is what I can do. So he takes a census of the people in the 24th chapter of 2 Samuel. And this is what he says in verses 15 through 17. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people of Dan even to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyeth the people, it is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was at the threshing place of Arana, the Jebusite. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel and smote, that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep 
What have they done? Let then thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. I want you to see what I'm talking about and I'll tie it for you just one more moment. David is in a place called the threshing floor of Aramon. He is right outside the city of Jerusalem. And there in the midst of the hills where the sheep are lowing and the threshing floor, they're threshing the wheat and the barley and they're harvesting it. There at the threshing floor of Aramon, the angel of the Lord stood to destroy the city of Jerusalem. He had already taken 70,000 lives in one day. A plague had fallen on the people. The Bible says, the Bible calls it a pestilence, doesn't call it a plague. He calls it a pestilence. Did God bring it? In this particular case, God sent it. God sent it to bring the nation of Israel to repentance. He really did not even send it to bring the nation of Israel to repentance. He sent it to bring one man to repentance. David, the head of the nation, had sinned before God. David had done disobedience. God said, I'm going to demand that he repent. God gave David the option to choose his own punishment. And we know the story how it could have been three years of famine. It could have been time of the enemy chasing him, his own enemy. But David said, I want to fall into your hands. I'm putting myself into your hands. I'm placing myself at your mercy. And God said, I will release a pestilence upon the people for three days. I don't know if David had any idea what falling into the hands of God could do. God can do more damage in one moment than all the nations of the earth can do uh, in, in 10 years or 10,000 years. God could speak and oblivion can happen to the earth. But 70,000 people had died of this pestilence. David now, the Bible tells us David turns and he sees an angel. The Bible says between heaven and earth. He's not on the earth. He's standing between heaven and the earth. Can I just throw this in as an aside? The battle for this earth is not taking place on this earth. The battle for this earth is not taking place in your flesh. The battle for this church is not taking place in our flesh. The battle for this nation is not taking place among the people. The battle for this nation is not taking place between Democrats and Republicans. The, the battle for humanity is not taking place on this earth. The battle for this earth and for humanity is taking place between heaven and the earth in the realm of the spirit. And there's a war going on for your soul and a war going on for my soul and a war going on. Thank you for joining us for Hope Alive an outreach of Greater Hope International Church, Lumberton, North Carolina. You're invited to worship with us each Sunday at 10.30 a.m. and each Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. To learn more, donate, or simply stay in touch with our ministry, download our mobile app or join us online at www.greaterhopeic.com. Thanks again for joining us. And we'll see you next time on Hope Alive.